Hello, everyone, and welcome to the third installment of our Trade Centric University Masterclass Series, Leveraging the Right Solutions to Meet Your Buyer's Needs. Today, our hosts are Kevin Kazemeyer, Head of Channel Development at Trade Centric, and Joey Wells, Product Support Manager at Volvo Financial Services. In this session, you will learn how to gain an inside look into the buyer's purchasing journey, discover customer pain points and a deeper understanding of their buying requirements, learn how to win more business with invoice automation and advanced shipping notices. But first, I'd like to turn your attention to the fourth installment of our Trade Centric Masterclass series, maximizing e-procurement growth and adoption scheduled for June 14th at 1 p.m. with host Kevin Kazemeyer and a special guest. I have dropped the link to register for that session in the chat. As a reminder, you are on mute for the duration of this Masterclass webinar. If you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A function and we will address them at the end. And now I'll turn it over to our guests, our hosts, Kevin and Joey. Hey, thank you, Melissa. Thank you everybody for joining uh, and welcome to our third session in our Masterclass webinar series. Uh, I'm really uh, happy to be joined today by Joey Wells from Volvo Financial and uh, appreciate you joining us today and, and, and sharing, you know, some of what you have on the invoice, uh, Joey. And, you know, before we get started, I was just hoping that you could share a little bit about your role and, and Volvo Financial. Hey, Kevin. Yeah, thanks uh, for the opportunity today. I think this is going to be uh, uh, very helpful and I hope it, uh, you know, is informative for a lot of people. Um, my name is Joey Wells. I work for Volvo Financial Services, which is a part of the Volvo truck brand, um, but we have more than just that. We uh, have um, Rockback, we have Mack trucks, uh, we have Volvo Penta, um, Volvo construction equipment, and then, um, you know, globally there's other brands uh, that we're involved with, but here primarily in North America, um, we work with Mack trucks, Volvo construction equipment, and Volvo trucks. And the area that I work is in uh, the aftermarket. So um, I help customers and dealers provide uh, financing for um, parts and services at our local dealers. And uh, that's sort of where me and my team work. And, uh, you know, we've been getting involved more and more in these customer integrations as we go along. So that's what my team does. Excellent. Thanks, Joey. So, I mean, a little unique, a little bit different than the traditional um, distributor model, but still there's that need from, from e-procurement. So again, happy to you, for you to be joining and sharing your story today. Um, so let's talk a little bit about, you know, what got us here, right? And, and really, it's all around the e-procurement cycle. So basically, um, if, if, if you've been with us before in the first couple of sessions, you've seen us introduce the procurement cycle and know that, you know, really this is the, the path that we've identified for success in organizations to really be um, successful in e-procurement and to grow their e-procurement. So we launched with Discover. We, our last session, we covered Enable and Engage. And today we're going to focus on Integrate. So in today's session, we're going to look at the entire buyer purchase journey and we're gonna discover the pain points that happen after PO creation. And we'll really we'll, we'll work to learn to how we can win more business and create stickiness with both invoice automation and shipping notifications. So, but first let's let's start with a little bit from what are we seeing from buyers? So your customers, those buyers that are out there. What, what do we actually see and, and what are some of the demands that they have? Well, basically, you know, buyers are placing more and more demands on their suppliers and they're looking for more ways to make their life easier and limit the amount of time and resources that they spend completing simple tasks, such as placing an order and paying an invoice. So we've grouped these four main topics, you know, into unified ordering process, spend visibility, invoice accuracy, and supply chain visibility. Now, many buyers are utilizing e-procurement and ERP systems, and they're deploying them to provide solutions to each of these specific areas. 
And I'm sure that, you know, you're probably familiar with the top two because most of those are addressed by many of you, whether it's access to your punch out site or the ability to accept POs, you know, these two alone allow buyers to, you know, not only control that order ordering process, but also gain visibility into their spend. It's the next two really that are a little more challenging. So when you think about invoice accuracy, it's a huge pain point with buyers today. You know, they spend countless hours reconciling inaccurate and non-compliant invoices, most of them that are probably not received via CXML or EDI. Now, supply chain transparency, you know, that's also of high importance, especially since COVID. You know, many of you provide inventory on your punch out, but what else are you doing to keep up with the communication and awareness of what happens after the PO has hit your order management or ERP system? So Joey, you know, question to you, what are you hearing from buyers when you think about these four main focus areas and, and how would you rank these in, in the order of what you hear from buyers? Well, um, I mean, we hear all of these, right? None of this should be, uh, um, eye opening to, to anyone. Um, we certainly have issues on the supply chain transparency piece. That one really stands out just simply because, you know, customers always want to know when, where, and how many can I get, right? What's the price it's going to be? Um, you know, the unified ordering process for sure, PO distribution, um, and punch out definitely, uh, resonate. But the, the one that I work in the most and, uh, you know, where we seem to, to get the most questions um, from my customers or from our customers is on the invoice accuracy piece, as you mentioned. Um, you know, we do at VFS last year, we did 1.5 million transactions. So um, that means we sent 1.5 million invoices to various customers across all ranges of systems and automation level. Um, you know, some receive just PDF copies of emails, um, but a lot of them are moving more and more towards an integrated invoicing capability. And that can mean many things, right? So um, some are the Coupas and the Arivas of the world where you have to match line for line, uh, price for price, quantity for quantity on the invoice to the purchase order, or they won't pay it. We have other customers that aren't necessarily at that sophistication level with their system, but they may have a mainframe system that, uh, that they've been building on for 40 years and they've built a lot of these checks and balances into them. So just because we don't necessarily have to match the purchase order line for line, um, we still have to have accurate invoices uh, get to them. And there's a lot of different ways that we've gone about doing that. Um, you know. There, there's just so many different nuances that come into what makes an invoice accurate that, uh, that you know, this conversation can go in so many different directions. Okay. It's interesting, right? So, so you mentioned that it's, it's not only the, the true e-procurements of the world, but there are others, you know, those backend systems, those ERPs, those are also opportunities. So when you get in with a customer, you know, I'm assuming you have to ask a lot of questions, right? And to understand where those opportunities are. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, that's, uh, you know, we've built a checklist and it breaks out into um, different pieces of, the, of this process. Um, you know, we start with punch out or posted catalog, a combination of both. Um, you know, we do some interesting things with repairs. So, you know, truck breaks down, has to go to the dealer, and there's a massive repair that might take 200 lines on a purchase order. Well, it's really hard to match all that invoicing. So, you know, there, there's just a lot of different uh, pieces to the equation there that you have to go through. So we developed a checklist to basically say, all right, in this area around punch out, are you capable of doing it? What system are you on? What are you looking for? In this area of hosted catalog, repairs, et cetera, what are you looking for? And then of course, invoice and the supply chain transparency. But these are all part of that checklist. Excellent. All right. That's 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 great. So, you know, it seems like that checklist actually kind of 
fits into what we would consider the, the traditional P2P process, right? So if you think about that, right, the traditional P2P, you know, consists of, you know, shop, some sort of shopping, an ordering piece, right, where I'm cutting a purchase order. Uh, how do I receive those goods? And then how do I pay for those goods? And when, when you think about that, right, many probably look at the shopping as your punch out site, right? And then you probably get an order and maybe you've integrated the purchase order. But what else, what else are you doing here, you know? And, and are you missing the rest of the cycle? Because what you when you think about it, after a PO is received, there are several opportunities to provide additional value to your buyers. On the receiving side, you know, documents such as order confirmations and advanced ship notice, well, they help with product availability and resource planning and, and really to know the exact whereabouts of your order. Now, as a consumer, you think about, you know, you, you place your orders on Amazon. I'm sure you all love the detail about when an order was picked and knowing that it was placed on a truck and, hey, where's my ETA? And, and even seeing how many stops you are away on that delivery schedule. Well, you know, your buyers probably don't have as sophisticated as a system to get all those capabilities, but their e-procurement systems have the way of consuming some of that data to display for their users. So the next best thing is shipment confirmation that could enable updates to their system on the PO, even allow it for PO change if there's something that differs from when they cut the PO to when you actually are able to provide the products or maybe not even provide a specific line item in that product. And what that does is it now aligns the PO to the invoice and makes things match easier. ASNs provide additional insight for knowing what to expect and when to expect them. So when can I have my resources on the dock ready for that? They also allow for that easy invoice reconciliation because now I have everything that I, I've needed and now I can reconcile against that. Now I'll get into that a little bit later, how that factors into something called three-way matching. But when, when you look at the pay step, invoices allow for quicker reconciliation and payment by providing the accurate touchless details to match the PO. So when you think about that, Joey, and you talk about how you play really in this invoicing space, um, first off, let's let's just talk about the the packing slips and invoices. You know, how do you see um, the value that you can provide? And knowing I know that you're not as technically down that path yet with the way your dealer network is, but how do you see how Volvo plays in that space and how your customers respond to that type of information? Yeah, so um, just a little bit about how our system works. So the purchase order goes to the dealer. So we have 400 plus dealer rooftops across the country, and they're the ones that receive the purchase order, um, and they're the ones that fulfill it, right? So when we talk, talk about advanced ship notice, Volvo can't really play in that world just simply because, as a corporation, just because we can't be reliant on how the dealer, the dealer is responsible for delivering those parts, right? It's not, uh, so unfortunately we don't have that piece of the equation, but a packing slip is delivered with, um, with uh, shipments when, when a dealer does deliver the parts. So they know what's on them, but they don't necessarily know that, you know, it's coming in two hours or whatever, which, you know, would be wonderful to have. Um, there's no doubt, but just not something that we're capable of really doing at this time. There's there's too many variables and too many different systems in the in the the middle of that to make that work. But on the invoicing side, um, you know, our customers, especially the more sophisticated ones, are using that packing slip to match against their invoice and their original purchase order to ensure that everything that they originally purchased is is what they're getting on the invoice. Um, you know, just a, an interesting thing here, Kevin, um, you know, when I look at these four boxes going left to right, it's interesting to see them this way, but it's almost like you could draw a line down the middle between purchase order and advanced shipping notice, because I think a lot of people live in the world of, you know, my goal is to, to do an e-commerce platform, or my goal is to ensure that the purchase order comes across correctly. But if you think about it, the 
back half, the second half, well, if you can't get paid on them, that causes a lot of problems. And that's sort of where, I, I don't know if every company is doing it this way, but as far as where we're sitting in uh, Volvo Financial Services, we have a very close relationship with the teams that are on the left-hand side to ensure that you know, you have to be a specific type of customer to do A and B in order to get to D, if that makes sense. No, that's perfect sense. And I like the way you put it. I like that that line down the middle because I think it's definitely, I think there's a, a, a group that just sees that that left side and a group that sees that right side. And if you can unify it all and you can think about that entire process, not only are you making it better for your customer, but you're actually improving a lot of things in your side as well. And I think we, we'll get into that later because you have some really good things to share when it comes to what you've seen from connecting this entire process. So I won't spoil it. Um, let's let's kind of jump into our next next slide and, and really it kind of builds off of what you just talked about, right? So you mentioned this whole piece about um, taking that packing slip and matching it to the invoice. So let's talk about two trends that are servicing more and more on the buyer side. And that's really three-way matching and accounts payable invoice automation. So for those of you who don't know, three-way matching is just a typical um, accounting function that ensures the accuracy and consistency between what a buyer has ordered and what they've been invoiced for. So it's taking three pieces of information, the original purchase order, the invoice that you've submitted from a supplier, and some sort of goods receipt and matching them all and paying it based off of that. If something falls out, if something doesn't match, it causes an exception, it causes more length of time to pay it, it causes more manual research, research time within your customer. That key piece is really the goods receipt. That goods receipt in most instances relies on a human. You know, like in Joey's case, right? Somebody takes a packing slip and tries to match it to paperwork to sign off on an invoice. And if they don't do it all, or if the packing list is lost, then all of a sudden there's an invoice that sits out there that that's not paid, right? In most e procurement systems, there is a step that even requires them to go into the system to actually physically complete the goods receipt before the PO can move into this okay to pay status. Now, in many companies, this process can involve a lot of time and effort, a lot of resources, a lot of tracking down individuals to complete receiving processes. And I've even seen it where in some cases they'll put like a 60 day cap. And after the 60 days, they'll assume that it's been received and then close it out and allow it to be paid. Now, again, that's a long time for you as a supplier to get paid. What I found that ASNs could really be used in lieu of a goods receipt and could be introduced into this three-way matching process as a way to, to help uh, accelerate the process. So, you know, having that conversation with your customer to say, do, do you do a goods receipt? And how could I help that along? Some will say it's not a full replacement and they may use it as a, a compliment. So, hey, if my, my user hasn't received it in 15 days and you send me a goods receipt, well, then, uh, an ASN, I'm going to use it as my goods receipt and I'm going to allow it to go okay to pay. If not, if it's 30 days, whatever, but that ASN in some cases I've seen has actually taken the place of the goods received. So it's a key, key piece in, in those organizations that are definitely doing three-way matching if you have the ability to produce these electronic documents. Now, you think about the other side of that, um, Joey, when, when you know going through that dealer network, right? And you talked about it's not easy to automate these, these shipping notifications right? But what happens if something misses? Like, tell me, tell me what happens if, if someone forgets to, to match the packing slip or they, you know, lose the packing slip, or maybe mm -hmm. better yet, the dealer doesn't include the packing slip. Which story do you want? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, we've had, we've had scenarios where customers will receive the packing slip from the dealer. So, so, you know, I'll reiterate again how our system works. So when the dealer receives the purchase order, they deliver the parts and they deliver that goods receipt. However, that's not the what the customer ultimately needs to pay. What happens is the dealer has an automated process where they send the invoices to our system. And then we essentially buy that receivable. We pay the dealer within two days. 
So now we are the ones that are going to invoice that customer via ED email PDF, like I mentioned, EDI, like I talked about with some of the legacy systems, CXML, whatever. Um, and what we found is some of those customers, because they have hundreds of sites across the country too, they may receive the goods receipt, go into their system, load it, and then pay it. Well, now, now we're out of sync, right? Um, because they've paid essentially an invoice that didn't come from us. So there's some training opportunities there, but there's also the point where an invoice comes in and maybe it has maybe it has three extra lines on the invoice that the the dealer didn't um, or the PO didn't actually have. But why would they do that? Maybe you know the dealer's trying to help out and say, oh, you missed these three gaskets. Right, you needed to add these to your invoice. I'll just go ahead and take care of it for you. Well, the customers that are expecting this three-way match basically say, I'm not paying for those three gaskets. They weren't on my purchase order. So we've built a lot of logic inside of those three little boxes right there. From the time we receive the invoice, we get a copy of the purchase order. And this is new as well as of just a few years ago because the purchase order always went to only the dealer. So now, um, due to some enhancements that we've made utilizing TradeCentric, for example, we receive a copy of the purchase order. And what we do is we have logic inside of our system that looks for the lines on the PO, looks for the lines on the invoice, and tries to match them. So you know we're assigning line reference numbers as automatically as we can to match the purchase order. And if something falls out, we send it to what's called the dealer correction queue, where the dealer can go in and, um, and manually fix it if, if that's what's necessary, or they can request the customer to send them an updated purchase order. Say, you know what, I needed to send you these three gaskets, you've already received them, please update your purchase order so that we can get you paid, right? So um, there's a lot of pieces that happen inside of there, and we're doing all of that to A, automate as much as possible and ensure payment at the end, and B, to help reduce the dispute process that would come out of that if we weren't doing it. Um, you know, and I, I mentioned we've done a lot of things in here. I don't know how much you want me to necessarily get into to this, but we built dashboards um, inside of that dealer correction queue to see how many invoices are going there. We can now measure which customer sites are, uh, are having the biggest issues, maybe where they're not creating the POs correctly. We've done, uh, uh, we can drill down into dealers to see maybe they're you know, not following the process correctly. There's all kinds of different uh, ways we can uh, parse that data, but you know, that's a lot of the stuff that we're doing in the middle here to make sure that our invoices are as accurate as possible when we send them to the customer for payment. Okay, so definitely three-way matching is important for, for Volvo and Volvo customers. Um, and I think I'd love for you to share a little bit more in detail. I know, I know you have a use case that you want to share with us, and I think it'll be valuable to talk a little bit more about that, that entire process. So um, definitely let's, let's dive into that in, in, in a couple of minutes here. But okay. you know, just to finish off this slide, the other, the other main trend that we see is this accounts payable invoice automation or a PIA. And this is kind of the latest buzz that industry experts are out there talking about. And they're they're saying that it's even more important than P2P. So rather than implementing a, a full procure to pay solution, maybe you should look at implementing some sort of accounts payable automation because there's such a resource drain on the AP teams within your customers. Now, if you think about it, there are a lot of them out on the market, and most of them only really focus on one aspect of invoices, and that's really taking paper, PDF, or an email, putting it through some sort of OCR type reader, and then converting it into an electronic document, right? And we'll call it quotes around electronic because all it is is it's taking whatever information it can read and putting it in a document, and there's no comparison enrichment, there's nothing else to it, right? So it's just an invoice capture. It still is causing some pain with, within your, your customer base. So if you happen to be doing this today and, hey, I'm sending out invoices, my invoices are going out via PDF and my, my, my buyer has no problem. I would ask you the question, are you asking them if it's a problem? Because, you know, 
I recently came back from a couple of uh, procurement conferences where speaking to buyers, most of their pain is in the accounts payable piece, is in the invoice piece. It's in the large percentage of failures and exceptions and disputes and rejections that they have to manage when it comes to their invoices. Even those that entered on a portal, they get challenged with because sometimes the portal doesn't match up. And sometimes the, as Joey mentioned, aligns don't match up, but it's still entered in the portal because, hey, that's what I showed that I shipped. So that's what I'm charging you, right? And you know, there's then becomes more and more time and effort spent on the supplier side. So now you have resources on both tried trying to figure this out. So Joey, I mean, thinking of that, and I know we, we talked about this a little bit, um, you've had some experience with having to push through invoices via PDF and your customers using these types of solutions, you know, what's that resource drain been like on your side? And, and what does that, that really look like? It can be substantial, um, not just on us, but on our dealers, um, on our customers. Um, there's so many different um, players in that world. And the less automated you can make it, the, the more troublesome it can become. Um, we're seeing a lot of customers moving away from that OCR sort of technology. Um, I won't say it's all, of course. Um, smaller customers are still utilizing that, or maybe they have somebody that manually enters the invoices on their behalf if they're only receiving a few a day. But anyone that's doing a lot of volume is certainly moving away from the OCR way of, uh, of receiving invoices to something that's more automated. Uh, just last year, we integrated with, I don't know, 12, 13 different customers for just invoicing. Um, we weren't even doing the, the front end piece. Um, we're having conversations with them about how we can enhance the process for them. But, uh, you know, and it's because they're, they're moving away from that, that OCR uh, technology. Oh, so that's a great point, right? So, so you decide that you wanna automate, but when you think about it, right? The buyer's expectations is really like the tip of the iceberg. They see this e-procurement, integrated e-procurement solution. They think it's all great and happy. And I see my suppliers, I can place an order. But what they miss is that, you know, these integrated solutions, the challenge on the supplier side to make it a success is where do you start? Where do you begin? And how do you handle all these different touch points? And what's most important to you? What's most important to your customer? There's really so many decisions to make and what may be good for some may not be good for others. So how do you bring this all together? How, how do you do it at, at Volvo? So we, uh, it's, it's an interesting conversation. Everybody wants the Amazon experience, right? That's what they're all looking for. And, you know, in a parts delivery world where you're relying on 400 plus dealers, that's not always possible. And then you start adding in things like, you know, parts availability and, um, you know, all the different challenges we've had over the last two or three years just around getting goods, it becomes complicated. So, you know, I mentioned that checklist earlier. That's a huge piece of, of what we use. Um, we have a, a team of people now um, that have really started to learn what the right questions are. And one thing that we've done too is we've worked with our sales team to start to listen for what the buzzwords are. Right. So if they start talking about something like, um, I don't know, if they mention a Coupa, right, it doesn't necessarily mean a sales team uh, person might know that. But we've educated them to say, if you start hearing the word Jagger, maybe that should perk your ears about like, well, what are they looking for? Right. What, what are they looking to do? Um, and, you know, uh, there's there's all kinds of opportunities around. um how you handle each of these different items. And I think having a sales team up front that really understands just at a high level, what it is you're trying to accomplish and how it all works. We actually met with uh, the national sales team yesterday for two hours. And this was a big part of the conversation because they're seeing more and more customers coming to them and, you know, maybe two years ago, they didn't even really know what they were hearing. And now they're starting to say, Oh, 
I see what you want to do. So that checklist is a big part. We send that out when uh, when a new customer comes along. Um, we talk to our dealers on a regular basis to see if they have any customers that are doing this sort of uh, integration stuff. And you know, one interesting thing is a lot of customers have gone to our dealers and said, hey, we're on Coupa. We want to sign you up and, and let you invoice us manually. Well, we're talking to our dealers saying, if you're doing that today and you're logging into a Coupa and PO flipping invoices, you really need to start thinking about how we get them integrated, right? Because you can't manage this. You get three, four, five customers doing that on different systems and you've got different logins. It's not sustainable, especially if you want to grow that customer, right? If that's a customer that you want to do more business with, not less, manual's just not going to make it happen. Yeah, and that's a great point, right? Because you think about in that buyer's mind, hey, I'm giving you access to this portal. You're set, right? Yeah, but go then you think about it. what's all your challenges. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yep. All right. So so now that you have this checklist, right, thinking about um, Volvo, you kind of do things a little bit differently, right? So sometimes, you know, we have, we talked about the P2P process, but let's think about looking at P2P from an alternative perspective, right? And, and in certain situations, it may be beneficial to begin at the end and work backwards. So do you look at the invoice? And, and, and I found this helpful in my past where sometimes if you look at the invoice, you can actually gather the requirements of what you need in a PO and in to set up in their punch out. And the punch out then becomes easy. So, you know, you like to say, Joey, that you work in reverse. What does backing into this process and working from pay to purchase do for you? Well, um, I could tell you that my bosses like it when we get paid. <laughs> so <laughs> if you start thinking about it from that perspective, the invoice is ultimately how that's going to happen, right? So there's all these pieces that happen up front that, um, that can create downstream impact, impacts if you don't know what is ultimately expected on the invoice. And I'll give you a, just an example of one such scenario. Let's say a customer comes to you and they're looking for, oh, sorry, go back. All right. I'll, I'll go to that one next. Um, let's say that a customer comes to you and says, I have 400 sites and I want to, to, uh, to know the site that ultimately is going to pay for that invoice um, when you send me the invoice. Okay, well, how do I know that? Right. If I started with punch out or the purchase order piece, I may not have ever thought to ask for, all right, on your CXML that you send to us, ensure that that site ID and that procurement code or whatever it is you need is on the purchase order so that when we send you the invoice back, we can put that on there. That's why starting from the end, and that's just one example of, of how this plays from the back to the front. And, you know, this is something we do with a lot of customers. I told you that we did 12 plus uh, just invoice only customers last year. We're still talking to them about the left side. That is the ultimate goal and that's where they wanna go. But they understand that this invoice piece is, is really critical to them. And as you said, Kevin, it, it just takes so many people and so many man hours if it doesn't go right to do the deep dive investigation that starting from that invoice side and working to the front makes a lot of sense. Uh, it's it's a great example. I love the 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 ID, the ship to ID, the bill to ID. I've had experiences with that in my past where that's that's key in a lot of these systems is I I need certain key pieces of information and if you don't understand it at the PO time, you may never have captured it. You you may you may have lost track of it, but if you back into it from the invoice side, it's a lot easier now to say, oh, this is where the value is passed on the PO and I can map that. So mm -hmm. that, that's great. So, you know, I know we jumped a little quickly here, but, you know, walk us through um, a, 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 some specific, specific examples or use case that, that you kind of seen from, from the Volvo side. Sure. So this is kind of a little bit of how this all started. Um, we had a, a large customer. Um, it was our largest customer, actually, and they were implementing Ariva. 
And, you know, they, I, they didn't even really understand what it was Ariba was going to do for them, but, you know, they were trying to integrate it and they had a, a third party that was setting it up for them. And, um, you know, they were like, well, we need to get the POs to your dealers, but we don't want to necessarily have to work with 400 independent dealers. We want to just be able to send the purchase orders to one place. And then we need to be able to, to receive the invoices back from one place. And, and that's kind of how we want it all to work, right? So that was the backdrop of this. And, you know, in order to meet this need, we did what I've heard so many of your customers did is we built an in-house system on the fly. Um, and, you know, as we continued to run into challenges, we would just continue to add on and add on to, to what the, uh, the capabilities of this in-house system was. Um, and, you know, the customer was really pushing. They wanted to get it done. They wanted to get it rolled out. And they are doing just tons of volume. So what happened was the more, customer, the more sites that we would add, the more dealers that we would add, the dealers didn't really know how to do it. The customer sites didn't really know how to do it. The customer didn't really know how Ariba worked fully. Um, we had this in-house system that we're just building on the fly, really, to make it all work. And, you know, what happens? Disputes double. <laughs> um, items going to uh, dealers, um, you know, coming back to them, chargebacks, uh, customer not paying. It just, it was through the roof, right? So, you know, there was a long time there where we had to build in uh, additional functionality to, to make this work. And eventually we got them to a clean place. Um, and then, you know, they decided, well, we're going to actually change to Coupa. Well, at that point, I realized the in-house system is not going to do this because we had other customers that were asking for similar things, right? Um, we need three-way match. We need, uh, we need our invoices to just uh, be exact to what the purchase order is. We need you to distribute the purchase orders for us um, to our dealers. And, you know, the list went on and on, and we just had no way of scaling it. So that's, that's really how this all started. So you mentioned that, right? You, you, you kind of hit something there. They, they need the, the PO and the invoice to match. And you talked about the lines. Um, why is that important? What, what's the importance of, of matching the line items or having that line items in sequence? So the way we do it is it, for, for these types of customers, anybody on an Ariba, Jagger, Coupa, any of those, we are sending CXML copies of the invoices to them. And we send them through trade centric and then this is how we're doing it today. And, uh, and then you guys facilitate, you know, whatever mechanism is that they need to receive it on their end. Um, but a lot of systems, even the, the sort of, um, uh, I don't want to say antiquated, just the, you know, the older ones that aren't necessarily a, a, a Koopa, um, they will auto reject an invoice if something doesn't match, you know, they've built that level of sophistication in there. So, um, you know, this all has to match. And that's why I, I mentioned earlier that sort of uh, correction queue that we have in the middle. That is to help streamline the process because the earlier you can catch it, the better. Because if it gets all the way to the customer system and then it goes into a on hold status, well, what does that mean? Who's looking at it? You know, and then, you know, daily they continue to go on hold and you get 200, 300 of these invoices that are now on hold and the dollar value grows. Well, that's a problem. So the sooner that we can catch it and the more matching we can do in the middle, the better. And that, that's, that's really where me and my team live. Not only are we turning on new customers, but we're constantly trying to figure out how do we grow this auto match percentage that we're doing by lines and how do we continue to streamline the processes that the dealers and the customers are having to do so that we're not taxing our team as much the year that this went live i, I mentioned that disputes doubled um you know how, how do you keep up with that you don't have you don't have the people to do it right no. um, you weren't you weren't built to do that so um it it got out of hand quick wow so um when you when you think about like what you just mentioned you're matching and you're making sure that everything is right you're not delivering it into your customers then you're you're actually put some checks and balances in place so you won't deliver a customer a bad invoice per se that's our goal 
our goal is to not deliver a bad invoice. And I will not say we are not 100%. We are not close. Um, we're at about probably 94%. Um, but when you're doing 1.5 million invoices, 6% can be a lot. Now, not all of those customers are integrated. So we're not sending 1.5 million in, uh, integrated invoices. But you can imagine where that 6% lives and how that can lead to, you know, just more work on the customer, more work on our side. And it's, it's not ideal. So, you know, nobody is looking to go add a lot of headcount. So how do you make it better? That's what we do. So, so on that point, right, thinking about what you just did and all the effort you made from implementing this first one and the learnings, what, what would you say or what advice would you give to everybody? Like, what's the tipping point from doing it manually to automated? Um, you know, th there's obviously we have people um, that for some accounts are going in and PO flipping some invoices, um, but understand that we're still delivering 94% at a, a high rate, right? So the idea is we deliver as much as possible uh, clean, then, um, you know, if something could be, o be PO flipped, then, you know, that's done, but we're trying to reduce that workload just simply because um, what we found is if you create a dispute, if on if the customer creates a dispute and you send it back to the to the dealer, then it, it sort of starts to change the mindset of how that customer or that dealer's doing something. Um, as far as the tipping point, it, it's hard to say. It depends on how many people you have, what your volume of uh, of um, you know of businesses. Uh, you know, I. I would say once you get past 15, 20 invoices in a day, I'm I'm moving. I'm trying to figure out something different, but that's probably a low threshold just simply because, I mean, it's not hard to go PO flip an invoice. That's not like a, a really long thing to do, but do you really want your people having to do that if you don't have to? And that's, that's kind of where I stand. It, and it sounds good for one or two or a handful, but then you start to think about the scale and the repeatability. It's like, what's the time and effort that go into that to actually do it at scale? And, and, and like I mentioned earlier, is if you're having to do a bunch of manual work for one particular customer, is that the customer that necessarily you want to grow business with? You know, maybe you're like, ah, it's not really worth my time. Whereas if you've got it integrated, there may be a lot more business out there that you haven't even looked into yet. And the more integrated you become, what we found is the more business they seem to want to do. Well, <laughs> that's a great transition. I mean, because, you know, let's talk about what some of your success has been, right? You, you, you've had a lot and you, you've kind of scaled and you've scaled quickly after that first one. You know, let's talk a little bit about some of those successes. Mm hmm yeah, so um, you know, freeing up internal resources—that's uh, huge. That is one of the biggest uh, drivers that me and my team are looking to do on a day-to-day -day basis. How do we? And not just internal resources, but you mentioned customer pain. Um, you know, their AP department—they don't want to sit there and have to look at invoice by invoice either. Um, yet their system is auto-rejecting them. Well, why are they auto-rejecting them? Right. That's what we're trying to figure out. Um, and then. Uh, you know, our internal team, and then of course the dealers, um, there's just a lot of manual work that goes into the, the problem. So we're trying to automate that and, and uh, make it as, uh, you know, clean as possible. Uh, but the other thing it does is it lets you scale, right? So now a customer that, that maybe, like I mentioned, you didn't want to do a lot more business with just because it was so painful. Well, now that customer that I mentioned um, that we did this with first, my boss says they're the cleanest customer we have now. They're like, they're awesome. the they're the poster child for this whole thing. Like, let's just do that over and over and over. Of course, no customer seems to have the same uh, idea of how to make that work. <laughs> so you have to have variables everywhere. Um, but sales is up. Our sales are up with them. Um, we integrated another customer last year to do um, punch out, uh, hosted catalog, repairs, and uh, integrated invoicing. Um, 
all the way through. We were looking at them yesterday and they're up 30% year over year. Wow. It's, so it's you, you grew it though by starting invoices. Yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. That's, it was, uh, it was a phenomenal um, undertaking because uh, in the past they were on Ariba and they were doing punch out and we did not have an integrated invoice process. Um, so as we flipped them over, we told them you could keep doing punch out, but we are going to integrate your, uh, your invoices. We are not going to do these manually anymore. We're not going to just send you um, invoices that we know are broken. So as we've gone down that path, like I mentioned, they're, they're transitioning more and more business to us. Um, and one of the customers that, uh, that I was talking about earlier that's on a, a mainframe system, they're up 27% this year, year over year. Uh, now, some of that is uh, inflation, right? But the interesting thing is it's 4,000 more invoices a month. Wow. Yeah. So that tells you, okay, this is easier. Let's move that way. So if they were on the fence, they're now saying, you know what? Volvo's making it easier for me. If I have a decision to make, I'm going that That's way right. than That's somebody exactly else. Right. That's what yeah. we're seeing. Interesting. So with the, on that, right, think about what advantages are you seeing in the overall marketplace? Because I know when, when we talked about you joining this, you know, you were like, hey, we're, we're, we're in a good spot right now. And, you know, we see ourselves as now leaders. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, you know, this customer that I was talking about um, that we we told them we're going to do invoice integration with them. Um, you know, you continue to punch out. But as you transition to your new system, we're going to to do the invoice integration, we kind of became almost like their coaches. Like, um, you know, we taught them how to make all this work inside of their system. We got to a point where we were having daily 30-minute uh, meetings with them. Um, and we kind of went through how every single process would work. And what that does is it allows, allows us to sort of drive the narrative and then other customers or other of their vendors have to conform to to our standards and it's not necessarily uh you know us having to figure out what it is you've implemented without talking to us so um it allows us early on in conversations with customers that that you could tell are kind of going in this direction to um to kind of say hey let us help you you know don't don't just do this on your own here are the things that we found caused the most pain um here are the items that that we think could be of value if you think about them now and then they start to bring us in, you know, now we're more involved in what the conversations are from an early point, as opposed to, you know, them just come to us and saying, hey, we implemented the system, we need you to turn it on next month. That's Excellent. never good. And, and, and so it's ultimately become a competitive advantage, advantage then too, right? For so sure. you're talking about you've grown sales on existing customers, but you have also are able to now shout from the rooftops to everybody else that you know, you're open for business this way and you'll accept all systems. That's right. So we're actually working with you guys um, uh, to find out what other customers of ours have uh, have integrated. And then um, we're going to start reaching out to them and say, hey, we have these capabilities. And, you know, our capabilities grow all the time. We actually are working with a, a, a smaller customer right now that uh, that needed something a little bit different. Okay, well, we can conform to that, right? We build all this other stuff. Let's make sure that that what you're looking for, we can do too. And it just continues to to um, expand our possibilities. Um, you know, this has all been done in the last three to four years, so it's been really interesting to to be a part of it um, as we've continued to grow and and move down this path. Awesome, awesome, and we're excited to be moving down the path with you. So, um, on that note. I want to open it up. First of all, thank you for sharing everything you shared so far. I'm going to open it up for questions. Uh, we have the chat open for, for questions. There are some, some good questions that have come in so far. Um, and we'll spend the next, you know, five, six minutes on, on questions before we, we close up with our tip of the month. Uh, so first one, Joey, uh, first question in says for you, uh, what did you do to get the decrease in disputes percentage low? And how do you stay on top of it? So um, the first thing we did was 
we had to start to understand why the customers were disputing them. Like, you know, this was all new to us. Um, you know, I mentioned when, when we started with that customer, when they started talking about line reference numbers, I'll be honest, I didn't even know what they were talking about. I was, you know, 15 years IT experience. I'm like, I, I don't know what a line reference number is. What are you asking for? Um, and then, you know, we, we, as we started to go down that path, we started to realize, okay, there's all these rules that we need to build into the systems to, to make that happen. So when we first started sending the invoices to the customers uh, for in test, um, we didn't have line reference numbers to, to match. So we built logic in just to make something work where we would just say, add one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. right? Don't even look at the purchase order because we don't even have a copy of it. Let's just see how many we can get in without having to, to fix it. So then we started building logic around like, how do we match this invoice to this purchase order to ensure that the line reference numbers are gonna match. Then we started building other checks and balances in around quantity, price, you know, just trying to ensure that, that everything is as clean as possible before we send it there um, to the customer. All right, great. And, and I, I laugh at that one about the numbering because uh, I've been in that situation where that was a solution that was <laughs> there's, recommended there's no to other me option. By, by my partners. It was like, yeah. well, yeah, let's throw one to 10 on them and see if they recognize. But what some people don't realize is that our buyers are really smart. They're really smart and they catch on to these things rather quickly. Yeah, yeah, it, it, didn't, it didn't go well. All right. So next question we have for you, Joey, is can you elaborate more on the dashboard you spoke about? Um, how do you use it and how do you gather the data? And the last part of that question, which I can answer right off the bat, does Trade Centric build the dashboard for you? No, we don't build the dashboard. This is something that Volvo built. So I will let Joey talk more to it. Sure. So this all started as a uh, a dive into disputes actually, which is was the last question. Um, we had a dealer here who uh, was essentially saying, you know what, um, customer X disputes every invoice. I don't understand why they're always disputing things. Well, remember I told you earlier that we have this uh, piece in the middle, this dashboard, this correction queue dashboard, or this correction queue that we try to ensure is uh, clean before we, we send the invoice um, to the customer. So what this dealer was meaning is I'm constantly having to work this customer's invoices, right? They were sort of lumping disputes in with the correction queue and combining them into everything gets disputed. Well, what's really happening is you guys are invoicing wrong for this customer and it goes to your correction queue and then you have to manage it. So we did a deep dive. We had somebody on our team do a deep dive into disputes and realize, you know what, it's not really that big of a percentage. But what we did then was, all right, that same work that you just did for disputes, go do that for the correction queue. Let's see which dealers are doing this not well. And what we found out is that dealer had like 18% of their invoices going to the correction queue. So, so we built a dashboard. It's a using Power BI um, that now daily gets updated with every single invoice that went to the correction queue and why. Um, and, you know, if, if we see a lot of invoices, we can even see like duplicate invoices. If the same invoice is being sent to the correction queue multiple days in a row, then we can reach out and say, hey, I see you're having a problem with invoice one, two, three. You know, what can we do to help? Uh, do we need to reach out to the customer and get you a new PO? Um, you know, there, there's a lot of those different things, but yeah, we build all that in-house just on the realization that it's going to be really hard to troubleshoot what the problems are if we're kind of just going on a gut feel. Right now we have real data backing up exactly what it is um, we're trying to accomplish. Great. Sounds like a great compliment to what we're doing and what we offer with the automated Absolutely. invoices and you providing that value to your dealers and your customers. Great. Awesome. Um, time for a couple more questions. I'm going to jump into this one because this is a, a good one. As a buyer, do we need to find a new supplier when they don't want to automate sending invoices or receiving electronic POs? And so I'm going to answer that first. And Joey, I'll, I'll let you give it from a supplier's point of view. But I would tell you as a, as a buyer, no. Um, there are opportunities for you to, to work with your suppliers, to encourage them. Um, and to also leverage our network, too, because uh, 
we have that ability to, to, to bring those suppliers and automate them more, even on the buyer side, right? But, you know, how would you look at that, Joey, as, as a supplier, you know, would you encourage them to go find a new supplier or what would your response be? I would encourage them to come to us. <laughs> so we if you weren't providing <laughs> that, right, what you, your talk track would be, hey, tell me what I need to do to retain your business, right? Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. So I think a lot of this is involves like conversations and sometimes we're afraid to have that conversation. And if we're, if we're a little upfront and understanding buyers and if buyers say, hey, this is what I need, this is what, what my gaps are. Like people are going to start realizing that there there's there's easier ways to automate. And I think, you know, selfishly, I'll say that we have a pretty good solution that can help. Um, Absolutely. Next question we have for you, Joey, is are you matching one for one for every line invoice, total tax, shipping fee, et cetera, for PO to invoice? Or are there any tolerances in place? We have built in some tolerances. Um but for the most part, we're trying to match as much of that as possible. Um, we can't, we don't match all of it. Taxes, um, shipping, we send to the header line because that's where our customers want it to go. Uh, that was actually one of the first changes. You mentioned um, what we did to reduce disputes and items going to the correction queue earlier. Uh, freight was a big um, issue. We had uh, one dealer management system that's about 30% of our dealers that didn't have the capability of sending in freight as anything other than a line item. Well, since that line item wasn't on the purchase order, you can imagine what the downstream impacts were of freight. So um, we started moving freight to the header and we actually, uh, you know, got the DMS to, to do that. And then, um, you know, we, we've built in some other logic inside of trade centric that helps manage things. So like another one is unit of measure. Our system doesn't necessarily have all the unit of measures that um, that a customer may need. So we've utilized trade centric on the customers that we're getting the purchase orders from to take the unit of measure off of the purchase order, look at the line reference numbers on the invoice to match to the purchase order. And then you guys, trade centric, puts that unit of measure back on the invoice for us to get it back into their system. That's just, you know, one of the benefits that working with you guys has done because you know, we didn't really have the capability of doing that. Excellent. And also, I think if you think about from a from a customer perspective, right, they also may have some tolerances themselves, too. They may they be do. able to share with you, hey, this is what my tolerance is. So that's also helpful in the requirements gathering piece. Yeah. So on the front end, um, we actually have tolerances built in. Uh, so we do what's called price verification to ensure that the purchase order doesn't come in at a price lower than what they've negotiated nationally. Um, and we build in some tolerances there just to ensure that, you know, within 5%, we still send them through because, um, for the most part, they'll make it through and get paid. But yeah, there's tolerances for sure. That's one of the key questions we have on our checklist actually is, do you have tolerances? Where are they? What are they? And, um, you know, they don't always want to share them with you. I'll be honest. There's some yeah. customers that are like, we do, but I'm not telling you what it is. Okay, yeah, so make it perfect. <laughs> yeah, make it perfect. <laughs> yep. All right. So looks like we're out of time for questions. We have some other great questions in the queue. We will be providing answers to them as a follow-up. We'll have a recording and the answers to all the questions that are that are in our queue. So I appreciate everybody's uh sending those in. It's now time for our tip of the month. And and this month's tip is kind of built on what we covered last month with re the reporting and analytics uh, on the business intelligence portal. But today, I just want to touch on an important yet overlooked feature in Portal. Did you know you could always see the active status of every document exchange via the trade-centric network? So basically, when you look at the activity of each request, you can leverage the history tab. And that can help you troubleshoot exceptions to see where they've been routed or where they are in the status of being submitted. So as you can see in this example here, this order is in an undelivered status to your system because of the order lines are different from the PO. So that means there's been some kind of rules when we set up the integration to the commerce system and, and that a punch out return and a PO in needed to match. You know, Joey mentioned that they have this matching on, on pricing, right? There's different matches that have to be done when, when orders are being received by backend systems and we're able to flag them. 
So this also acknowledged that a notification was sent to a specific team about this particular um, exception. You know, it's in a rejected status. So these validation rules, they're all configured when setting up your, your initial integration. You know, here's another great example where this one was like an invalid order number. So someone pushed through and didn't enter, didn't add a PO on their PO number or something like that, where it was rejected going into one of our customers' backend systems or commerce systems. So really, again, these are configurable settings. This is a great way to go and be your first line of defense to troubleshoot if you're like, my customer said they sent me a PO, but I'm not seeing it. You know, you're going to see these validation rules that can be set up in the initial integration, and they can also be set up by customer integration. The messaging and the codes, they're going to vary by your storefront type, our integration type with your storefront, and the delivery type. But again, email notifications can also be configured by status, and they can be sent to go to multiple addresses. So with that said, for more details on Portal and its the list of status codes and any other capabilities, please work with your, your CSM. And with that, I'd like to thank Joey for attending today. It's been really a pleasure going through invoicing and the value of invoicing. I uh, appreciate everyone's uh, time and attendance today. And uh, thank you for joining and we'll see you next time. Yes, thank you, Kevin and Joey. And thank you everyone for joining. As a reminder, please be on the lookout for details of the fourth installment of the Trade Centric University Masterclass Series maximizing e-procurement growth and adoption scheduled for June 14th at 1 p.m. Enjoy the rest of your day.